Welcome to Teaching Through the Bible with Dr. Ken Sullivan. As a veteran senior pastor, Dr. Sullivan understands the importance of Bible teaching in the spiritual growth and development of God's people. Dr. Sullivan's method of teaching the Bible is to read and carefully explain each chapter and verse in clear and understandable terms so the student of the Bible gains the full understanding of God's Word. Now prepare yourself to learn and grow as Dr. Sullivan teaches through the Bible. Well, hello and welcome to another session of Teaching Through the Bible. I'm Dr. Kenneth Sullivan. Well, you know, the Bible tells us to pastors to uh, read and explain the scriptures, and that's what, that's what we're doing here on uh, Teaching Through the Bible. So now today we're studying in the book of the Gospel of John, um, chapter 1, part 2. Now, because this is such a long chapter, 51 verses, uh, we had to break this up into two sessions. So last time we studied uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 28, and today we will begin at uh, chapter 1, verse 29, and we'll complete this chapter today. So let's jump right into our study. Uh, the Gospel of St. John, chapter 1, and I'm reading verse 29 in the New Living Translation. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, the day after John had uh, been questioned by the Pharisees who were sent from the religious leaders to examine him as to who he was, Jesus walked up to him and John declared before all of those presents that Jesus was indeed the Lamb of God. Now, when John calls Jesus the Lamb of God, he he's actually announcing that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies that predicted that the Messiah uh, would be the one who would come and who would give his life as a ransom or a sacrifice to take away the sin of the whole world. Now, the ram caught in the thicket in, in the uh, book of Genesis, Abraham's sacrifice, when Abraham went to sacrifice his son at the behest of God, uh, and at the last minute, uh, he looked and there was a, a, a ram caught in the thicket. Uh, that was a symbol of Christ, the Lamb of God. The Passover lamb that was uh, slain, that was sacrificed, those lambs in the book of Exodus chapter 12 that uh, had to be slain and have their blood smeared on the doorpost to save the Israelites from the, uh, the death angel who was coming through Egypt to destroy all the firstborn. That was a symbol uh, of Christ, the Lamb of God. And the whole animal sacrificial system that, that God put in place for the, the Jewish people in the Old Testament, uh, under the Old Covenant, uh, all of those sacrifices were symbolic of the Lamb of God. The prophet Isaiah prophesied in vivid details uh, that the Messiah uh, would suffer and that he would, he would die for the sins of the world. In, um, in Isaiah chapter 53, uh, it's particularly verse 7, uh, Christ suffered as a lamb uh, who was uh, silent before his shearers, before those who slaughtered it. Um, Jesus Christ symbolized, uh, that lamb actually symbolized Jesus Christ. Um, Isaiah told in bold relief and in, in, in uh, uh, vivid details how the Messiah would come and, and how he would suffer for the whole world not for his own sin, but for the sins of the whole world. Uh, and so John is announcing that all of these prophecies that have gone forth, that have been predicted, ha that have been given uh, in the Old Testament leading up until uh, this particular time that John was baptizing of people, uh, that this lamb, Jesus Christ, is indeed that lamb of God that was predicted. Uh, now I'm reading verses 30, 30 and 34. He is the one who I was talking about when I said, a man is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. I did not recognize him as the Messiah, but I have been baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John testif testified, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting upon him. I didn't know he was the one, but when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me, uh, the one on whom you see the Spirit descend and rest is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I saw this happen to Jesus, 
So I testify that he is the chosen one of God. So now, John's testimony about Jesus demonstrates uh, Jesus is actually his eternal existence, his, his deity, that, that, that is his godship, if you will. John was born actually six months before Jesus. And you can read about that in Luke chapter one, verses 26 through 31. Yet he says that Jesus was before him. Of course, he's speaking of Jesus's pre-existence and of his deity. Jesus did not begin his existence uh, when he was born of the Virgin Mary. Uh, he has always existed along with the Father. Uh, he became known as the Son of God after being born in human flesh. Uh, that is, he was presented as the Son of God, God's own Son, uh, as he was born after he was born of the, the Virgin Mary. Now, prior to that time, John describes him as God the Word in John 1 and 1 through 4. Now, John said he didn't recognize Jesus as the Messiah uh, when he first saw him. Uh, although they were cousins by blood, um, John had probably never met Jesus uh, uh, before baptizing him. Jesus came to him to be baptized. Now, now this was because they were the uh, God in his divine purpose had kept these men separate. Um, and, and Luke um, chapter one, verse 80, it lets us know that, that John separated himself from people and he went out into the wilderness. He grew up uh, and he, he lived in the, a wilderness, uh, a sort of an, a, an ascetic lifestyle where he uh, would deprive himself of, of, um, of so many things. He, he was just like a, um, a hermit, if you will, out in the wilderness by himself uh, until the time he began to baptize. So he separated himself from society and he dwelt out in the desert wilderness. Now, John lived that separated life for people from people until he began his ministry of baptizing people in preparation uh, for the Messiah to come uh, and to save them. So John's mission was to actually testify to the nation Israel that their Messiah had come. God sent him out to baptize people as a, a platform to prepare them um, to hear and receive his testimony and to receive the Messiah who was coming right on his heel. Now, perhaps God wanted to unveil Jesus to the world at this precise time in history. Um, we know that when Jesus was baptized by John, it was revealed to him who Jesus was. God had told John how to recognize uh, the Messiah uh, when he came along. Uh, he would be the one upon whom the Holy Spirit would descend like a dove and it would remain upon him. Now, when John saw this happen to Jesus, he knew for certain that he was the anointed one, the son of God, the, the chosen Messiah. Now, in verse 34, the, the New Living Translation refers to Jesus as the chosen one of God. Uh, which he is, uh, but other translations states that he is the son of God. Uh, and this is important because it conveys the deity of Christ and his co-equal status with God the Father. He is the son of God or God the Son. Now I'm reading verses 35 through 39. The following day, John was again standing with two of his disciples as Jesus walked by. John looked at him and declared, look, there is the, the Lamb of God. When John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. Jesus looked around and saw them following. What do you want? He asked them. They replied, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come and see, he said. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon when they went with him to the place where he was staying, uh, and they remained with him the rest of the day. Now, when Jesus came back by, where John was baptizing the next day, uh, John again announced to the crowd, behold the Lamb of God. Uh, this is the Lamb of God. So John's primary mission uh, was to let the world know that Jesus was the Lamb of God. Um, he was like a voice crying in the wilderness, as we saw in, in the last uh, portion of this chapter, uh, that uh, he didn't proclaim himself, he proclaimed Christ. Now the crowd understood that the Lamb of God was also the, uh, uh, that this meant that he was the Messiah. The Lamb of God was the Messiah. So two of John's disciples 
left him and began following Jesus. One of, uh, one of these uh, disciples is revealed uh, to be Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Um, and the other may be John who wrote this gospel of John. Now, they naturally wanted to uh, meet the long-awaited Messiah and to follow him and to get to know him. Um, now, I like the way that Jesus responded to, to these two men who were following him. He saw them following him, and he asked them the probing question, uh, what do you want or, or, or what do you seek? Uh, and they asked where he was staying. Now, the proper answer, of course, to this probing question to us today and to, it, to people of all generations, uh, what do you want is, we want you. Uh, we want you, Jesus. We, we need Jesus to rescue us from our sins and to grant us forgiveness of those sins and, and uh, to free us and to cleanse us from our sins and from the consequences of those sins and to transform our lives to help us through this life, and of course, to give us eternal life. So Jesus warmly invited them to come with him to his place. Uh, he invited them not just to visit, but to actually live with him. And for the final three years of his life, uh, these disciples and others came to abide with Jesus. They came to, to live with him so they could get to know his teaching and to get to know his lifestyle and his example, um, and, and they followed him 24-7. Um, they were with him. Now, this warm acceptance is in, uh, indicative, actually, of the way that Jesus warm, warmly welcomes anyone who wants to follow him uh, and, and get to know him. If you want to know Jesus, he welcomes you. Uh, he warmly welcomes us in, and, and he expects us to abide with him forever. Now, life with Jesus is not a temporary arrangement. Uh, it's, it's permanent. It's eternal. Now, note that John wasn't offended that two of his disciples left him to follow Jesus. John fully understood that the people didn't belong to him, that they, they belonged to Jesus, their creator. John knew that his assignment was not to, to gather a following and have people to, to remain loyal to him and just follow him. Uh, he knew that his role was to to uh, get disciples, gather up disciples to follow Jesus. And so he wasn't offended at all, um, uh, but he was fulfilled. When, when the people came and were baptized and they left and followed Jesus, uh, his mission was being accomplished. Now I'm reading verses 40 through 42. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who heard what John said and then followed Jesus. Andrew went to find his brother Simon and told him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, Your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. Now, Andrew did what was natural here. Uh, when we make a major discovery or we learn about something that is valuable or beneficial, uh, we immediately tell our friends and our relatives. Uh, we can't wait to rush out and, and, and share the good news with those closest to us. So Andrew went straight to his brother, Simon Peter, uh, and told him that, uh, that uh, they, had, they had discovered, uh, they had made the discovery of a lifetime. It was uh, like discovering great treasure. He said, we have found the Messiah, the Christ, uh, and Andrew's statement about Jesus makes it, makes it crystal clear that they all understood that Jesus was the Messiah. This Lamb of God was the Messiah. Now, Andrew led his brother Simon to Jesus. Um, we see in Andrew's actions one of, one of the natural ways that the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, should be spread. People who discover Jesus and experience his love and his blessings and, and his goodness should go tell their near relatives and, and friends, and invite them to meet Jesus. Of course, there's also the, uh, the public preaching or proclamation of the gospel to large crowds or small crowds of people by various means, uh, which is also it's, it's extremely important for us to do that. Uh, but the simple method of just 
Witnessing to those that we know is a very effective method of evangelism that reaches many people. Now, when Jesus saw Simon, he gave him the nickname Cephas or Peter, which is an Aramaic word that means stone. By giving Simon uh, this name, Jesus was predicting that uh, he would become a strong and stable person uh, in the church. Now I'm reading verses 43 through 44. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, come follow me. Philip was from uh, Bethsaida, Andrew and Peter's hometown. Now the following day, Jesus traveled to Galilee and found another disciple, Philip, and he invited him to become his fourth disciple. Now being from the same town of Bethsaida as the two brothers, Andrew and Simon Peter, uh, the three men naturally knew each other. Bethsaida was a fishing village on the shore of the, the Sea of Galilee. Now, Bethsaida means the house of the fisher. Um, it is the village where Jesus was, uh, where he, he later uh, fed uh, 5,000 and, and he healed a blind man there as well. Now, it's important to note that these men didn't just pick up and, and follow Jesus out of the blue without knowing anything about him. Um, they had seen him, um, and, and he had seen them. Uh, Jesus had somewhat established somewhat of a, of a reputation um, uh, around the, that, those parts, and, and the witness of John was also validating of, the, of, of him as the Messiah. So some of the disciples had also seen him and probably heard him teach, preach, and uh, perhaps do miracles. Uh, of course, uh, we know that um, Peter saw him do a miracle. Uh, an example of this is in Luke chapter 5, where, where Simon Peter saw Jesus perform this miracle of the great catch of fish. Now, these men had seen evidence of the fact that Jesus was indeed the Christ before they committed to dropping everything and following him. Uh, when, when Peter saw him uh, direct him how to catch those, uh, that great catch of fish, uh, Peter's reaction was, depart from me, O Lord, I'm, I'm a sinful man. Uh, but Jesus said to him, uh, from now on, you're going to catch men. So they didn't just pick up and follow Jesus directly out of the blue. Um, they had seen him. They had heard of him, perhaps seen his teaching, perhaps seen some of his miracles. Now, now I'm reading verses 45 through 51, and we'll finish this chapter. Philip went, look, went to look for Nathanael and told him, we have found the very person Moses and the prophets wrote about. His name is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nazareth, exclaimed Nathanael. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Come and see for yourself, Philip, re Philip replied. As they approached, Jesus said, now here is a genuine son of Israel, a man of complete integrity. How do you know about me? Nathanael asked. Jesus replied, I could see you under the fig tree before Philip found you. Then Nathanael exclaimed, Rabbi, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. Jesus asked him, do you believe this just because I told you I had seen you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than this. Then he said, I tell you the truth, you will all see heaven open and the angels of God going up and down on the son of man the one who is the stairway between heaven and earth. Now, like Andrew, uh, Philip did what was normal. After becoming convinced that Jesus was the Christ or the Messiah, he went to his friend Nathaniel uh, and he told him that uh, they had found the long-awaited Messiah that Moses and the prophets of old had written about. Um, and, and they had prophet about, prophesied about so long ago. Now, the whole of the Old Testament had predicted the coming of this great rescuer. This was very exciting news. The Jewish people had waited for more than 1,400 years for Messiah to come. This was fantastic news. Um, these disciples actually had the privilege of, of, of meeting and being in close fellowship with the anointed one who was expected to come and to rescue Israel and set up his everlasting kingdom upon the earth. This was electrifying news, and, and these men were eager to share it with those that they knew. So 
uh, they just spontaneously went out telling people this great news that Israel had waited for for so long. Now, Philip identified the Messiah as Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Um, Nathaniel expressed a small degree of doubt about anything good coming out of the city of Nazareth. He had a low opinion of the, of the people of Nazareth. Now, he assumed that nothing or, or no one good could come out of there. But Philip used the same words that Jesus used to invite them to follow him. He simply said, come and see. Now, Nathaniel, also known as Bartholomew, was a devout observer of the Jewish law. And uh, he was a man of great integrity. And Jesus revealed his knowledge of, of Nathaniel's character um, when he saw him coming. He was an Israelite who, who did not, Nathaniel was an Israelite, Israelite who didn't deceive people. He, he, he didn't have any guile in him, that is, uh, any deception in him. He was, he was just a man who believed uh, and followed God as best he knew how. Um, he was a man of complete honesty and, and a man of complete integrity, and Jesus admired that about him. Jesus was, uh, was actually revealing his ability to discern the hearts uh, uh, of every man. Nathaniel asked Jesus how he knew him when he told him he was a, uh, an Israelite who had no guile in him. Nathaniel wanted to know, how did you know me? Uh, when Jesus revealed the fact that before um, Philip went to get him, he saw him sitting under uh, this fig tree. And now this, this phrase, sitting under a fig tree, um, actually denotes studying the, the uh, Torah or the uh, first five books of Moses. It's, uh, it was an expression that they use, uh, that the rabbis used when they said sitting under a fig tree. Uh, it generally meant that, that one was uh, meditating or studying the word of God. Now, the fact that Jesus was able to see Nathaniel sitting under a fig tree without actually being present was enough to convince Nathaniel uh, that Jesus was indeed the long-awaited Messiah, the Son of God, and, and the coming king who would rule over Israel. Nathaniel did, didn't require much convincing. His, his faith leaped, and he was ready to believe Jesus. And Jesus promised and prophesied to Nathaniel that he would see many more um, great and wonderful things, many more supernatural things, than what he had witnessed. Uh, he would see angels ascending and descending uh, from an open heaven upon the Son of Man. Now, Jesus referred to himself as a stairway between heaven and earth. Now, Nathaniel would indeed see many great signs and wonders and miracles, including Jesus turning water to wine, healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons, opening blind eyes and, and feeding multitudes. He would see the resurrected, glorified Christ, and he would witness his ascension back to heaven. Uh, he would also participate uh, in God-ordained uh, uh, miracles during Jesus' earthly ministry uh, up on earth and, and continuing on into the early history of the church as recorded in the book of Acts. Uh, uh, Nathaniel was, was in to see some great and marvelous things. Now, in verse 51, Jesus referred to himself as the stairway to heaven, meaning that he is the bridge or the link between heaven and earth. Jacob um, first saw this image, imagery of, uh, of angels ascending and descending from earth uh, to heaven and back and forth on a ladder or a stairway in a dream that he had. This is recorded in Genesis chapter 28. Now, Angels will come and go from heaven uh, and earth in service uh, of Jesus as he carries out his mission of saving the world. Jesus is ushering in a, a new covenant, and, and, and he will unveil and ratify that uh, the covenant, and the angels will serve him as he carries out his ministry. The disciples would see some of these angels serving him, and some would, would not be seen. Angels ministered to Jesus after his 40-day fast in Matthew 4 and 11. Uh, angels were at the tomb after the resurrection. Uh, angel, an angel came and strengthened Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane in Luke chapter 22. Now, Jesus uses this metaphor of himself as a stairway to heaven to convey that he is 
the means by which we enter or gain access to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's John 14 and 6 in the a New International Version. Jesus also said, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. That's John 10, 9 in the New King James Version. So Jesus opens a way of access between God and man. Um, he will one day bring heaven and, and earth together as one in one great merger. And God will live among his people uh, and we will ultimately rule and reign upon the earth under God and Christ. Now in verse 51, Jesus refers himself also as the son of man. Now this is another way of identifying himself as the Messiah by referencing Daniel's prophecy that identifies Messiah as the son of man, the coming eternal king uh, who would return and take over the earth and rule it forever. Daniel wrote these words uh, about 500 years before Christ was born in the body of a human being. Uh, Daniel said, uh, I was watching in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. That's Daniel 7, 13 through 14 in the New King James Version. Now, when Jesus refers to himself as the son of man, in essence, he is saying, uh, I'm the one that Daniel prophesied about. Daniel's prophecy revealed that the eternal God would rule as a son of man. The ancient of days is a reference to God the Father, and the son of man is a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the king who will return and take over this earth. He will destroy the wicked and bind Satan and lock him away in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. He will establish his kingdom upon this earth for a thousand years. Then he will cast Satan and his followers into the lake of fire and create a new heaven and a new earth. And uh, we, his people, will reign with him over it forever and forever. Well, that's a good close uh, to this chapter. That brings us to the end of the Gospel of John chapter 1. Next time, we will study chapter 2. Now, just for your information, I've talked through most of the books of the New Testament now, and they're available to you. You can watch any of these videos by clicking on the link on my Facebook page. The link is printed right below my name. You can just click on it, and it'll take you to uh, directly to the, to the whole list of videos. And uh, Now, you can also copy this link uh, and send it to your friends, and they can watch uh, any of these videos as well. Well, I want to invite you to tune in to one of our services at New Direction Church where my son, Kenneth Sullivan Jr., is the, uh, is the uh, senior pastor. During this uh, COVID pandemic, uh, we live stream our services Sundays at 8.30 a.m. and 11.30 a.m. and Wednesdays at 7 p.m. at ndcbetterlife.org. Please join us for any and all of these services. Now, until next time, may God bless you and keep you safe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for tuning in to Teaching Through the Bible with Dr. Ken Sullivan. We hope this program has benefited you in your Christian walk. For a free download of this program and to browse Dr. Sullivan's books, videos, and audio titles, visit our website at EmergeCurriculum.com.